Yay! Yay! Hello, we're here! Yay! Yay! All right, so thank you, everybody. That's uh, welcome to uh, Build a World with us. We're going to talk about world building and then we're going to world build together in a little jam. And all of you in the chat, we're hoping to be part of that. Um, so I'll start and then maybe Pam and Michelle will talk about the first bit. And if there's some internet trouble, we'll just roll with it and you can type in the chat and I, uh, one of us will say this is what Michelle's have saying. Uh, been there, done that. Okay, I'm McGay Baker. I am a game designer and many other things. I co-designed Apocalypse World and founded the Powered by the Apocalypse design philosophy, I guess. Um, and uh, Under Hollow Hills and Cyron and a bunch of other stuff. I do game design, I do museum design, I do storytelling, and I work with a lot of uh, teen advocacy around uh, LGBTQIA stuff. Um, that's where I'm at right now. Pam, you wanna go next? Oh, so uh, I'm Pam Ponzalan, and I am a Filipina queer currently based in Ontario. I do a lot of design work, primarily actually inspired by Powered by the Apocalypse and Blaze in the Dark. But some of my more official credits include Journey to the Radiant Citadel, Hunter the Reckoning, Thirst Sea Sword Lesbians, uh, Spire Shadow Operations, and some Paizo stuff. Uh, I still have more things to go, and I'm very happy to be here. Woohoo! All right, Michelle. Hey, I am Nichelle Schneider. Um, I am rather uh, kind of quiet within this space usually, uh, but I'm going to do my best here. Um, my, I am a game designer and sensitivity consultant in tabletop RPGs. My work has been uh, Blades in the Dark, Wild Sea, Monster Care Squad, um, and many more. And when I'm not writing or consulting, I um, help advocate um, for tribal projects as well as BIPOC and disability awareness. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, let's do the reverse order for the for like the other first question of what's a world that you made, Michelle, or or had a part in making? that you particularly like and like what's one deal about one uh detail about it that you particularly would like oh okay so uh and like a personal game or like a like a world building whatever. like a project whatever yeah whatever that whatever that question meant to you that's the right <laughs> answer well, I think one of my personal ones from a personal campaign that I really enjoyed was I did a um, Udawasha um, Blades in the Dark campaign um, with Aruvia, and I did a lot of world building for it. And I actually came up with a postal service that was based on a uh, creature that essentially they have a memory uh, that's like locked in. So as long as they've walked a particular path, they will forever know that particular trail. And mm -hmm. so they, um, different businesses and everything will have these essentially like these uh, bricks or these tiles with different symbols on them and the creatures recognize them. So they know what's on their route and essentially they will go and it's like an automated postal service. Uh, yes. Cool. So that, that's from a personal world building. And I was like, oh my God, this is like the coolest thing ever. And my players never interacted with it. <laughs> but I had fun. Excellent. Yeah. Pam, go. Well, recently, uh, Navithim's End got its print run. And I had the greatest pleasure of joining my partner because my partner made the game first. Like everybody should know, like, that was Sin's baby. Uh, and then they were like, love, do you want to join me? And I was like, hell, fucking yeah. So, <laughs> of course I do. I'm just vibrating and please let me do the thing. <laughs> right. So my my favorite aspects beyond the mechanical stuff I contributed were the backgrounds. Because mm -hmm. Sin had this idea that there are three continents. And then there's an unknowable world beyond that in the sky and in the sea and outside. So we needed to give backgrounds as touchstones for players 
and I just went like wild with the terminating <laughs> witch backgrounds went where like uh, I, I'm a huge fan of Witcher the game I'm not sure I'm, I'm not very comfortable with the company but the game spoke to me on some visceral level so I was like I'm gonna make a Witcher background then after that I wanted to make a background that spoke to the Southeast Asian diversity of like having a lot of different identities but all being kind of crammed in one place in a place that generally hates you so I was hmm. like do that where it's all about resistance against that and then because i love our fairy and legend i made another background which was again specific to a continent where you are a knight for that throne and you inherit a name in a book of names so it's actually frowned upon to make your own name so if you make your own name you better fucking, fucking prove that you can do the thing because you're not inheriting someone else's legacy mm-hmm. on that my other personal project, which uh, Nichelle did wonderful work with, by the way, uh, is the Dagger Isle supplement. Because uh, I was very lucky that John Harper and Sean Itner were like, okay, Pam, you can do the thing. And I was like, really? I can? So, <laughs> so now it was such a good team with that project. <laughs> such a good team. Yeah. And like the, the I'm the, so the- proud of you. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm really excited because everybody made their own like city, but it's not really a city. I, I, I can go into another panel sometime. Like, yeah. It's not really a city, but like for me, I wanted to do one about Manila. So my, ins- mm-hmm. my inspiration was my very strange capital that still has a lot of imperial trappings around it. So it's like literally a, a place where they killed their God and that mm. God may be sleeping in the tree. And the tree is now in, is now emitting this purple haze that has voices in it. And nobody knows what those voices are saying. Love it. So like, that's the world. That's my like little touchstone in there. Uh, so yeah. I yeah. did play with that during a play test the, when we were working with oh. the playbooks. And yeah. I pulled their heartstrings with that particular one. Yes. <laughs> because why not? It was the best. <laughs> it's so... It, 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 like. Oh. World building does that though. It is visceral, you know, it gets, mm-hmm. it, it, there's a piece of it. Um, and I'm going to skip my bit of like favorite world that I've designed just to, because I really love the note that uh, Michelle, you brought out of like doing incredible world building that then the players may never engage with, but it makes it richer for you because not only are we pulling other people's heart springs, we're pulling at our own because we're pulling all of that out of our own experience and out of our own mind of like what would mm-hmm. it be like if this and like that question of like what would it be like is such a a big one and the freedom to imagine different worlds imagine something entirely else um i'm involved in a world building thing right now where one of the baseline uh like bedrock conditions of this um collaborative world building uh, exercise is that there is no sexual violence, period, full stop, the end, none. Yes, please, let's imagine worlds that are better than the ones we're in, you know? Fantastic. Um, so we have a couple questions already, but I'm gonna go through the ones that we listed in the <laughs> um, blurb first, which ties right into this, which is like, where to start? Where do you start building? A world, and for me, and we'll just do the back and forth and back and forth thing, if that's all right. Works for me. Um, awesome. For me, the place that I start is a lot like Michelle's, like postal service. I find something that is not big about the world, but makes it feel real to me. You know, I, I either look at like, okay, when I imagine people in this world, what are they wearing, and how does that I. I can world. I've I've written entire huge long things about follow the thread. If you look on Twitter, you look from like follow the thread. There's my whole stuff, and on our Patreon, there's endless stuff about this. Um, that food is great. Like, what are they eating, and what does that mean about every part of their world? And um, and the other thing is music. Like, what instruments are they playing? What sounds do they hear? When are they playing music? All of these things. And then it's just like this pack, this process of unpacking and unpacking and unpacking. And that's that's where I'm at. Um, or like where I start from and where I recommend that people start from. Do you have a different take on that, Pam? Not really, actually. I love the minutiae because that's mm-hmm. what makes the pudding for me, right? 
uh, because mm-hmm. every body, like I like describing, especially if you go into like a post-colonial or like anti-colonial mindset, and all of those terms, mm. those terms are very big. Yes, let's acknowledge that they're huge terms. And one queer girl, all right. So this is just my perspective on it, right? But like a colonized body, from the way I see it, is created out of the sediment of many experiences, yes. and it is in dissecting those grains that you can really go into it like as, as you said the, the food the music when you step down that street what do you see what's the first thing that might catch your eye whether you are supposed to be familiar with the place or whether you are entirely new because those are two different perspectives or if you're somebody coming home like you're supposed to have ties to that place for whatever reason but you you didn't grow up there you've never been there mm-hmm. this is your first time going there because th- those layers will all inform your sensory perception so when you when you go into that stuff you can really get down and um you can get more intriguing perspectives i feel versus mm-hmm. like trying to uh, go from the big idea of the planet or country, uh, like go down to the small, and then you can even like defamiliarize things uh, from like y- you know this object to be what it is. But if you try to turn your head around and go like, but what if like I had no idea what it was? How would I describe that to somebody who has lived yes. in this, right? Yeah, like the, the archaeology <laughs> mindset of like, yeah. what if I had no idea what this was? <laughs> and like, I'm in the process of accessioning into one of the museums uh, that I work with a um, rotary dial telephone. You know, and they're like, it's only, it's from 1960, who cares? I'm like, do you realize that no one under 20 has used one of these? <laughs> anyway, sorry, Nichelle, what's your, what's your, where to start? I, I will say that it's very much the same thing, but I seem to focus that minutia on connections. So playing into the question as well, um, that was posted here in the chat, is there a particular world building tidbit that you tend to insert into any or most worlds? And my thing very, my strength very much so in world building is the connection with the players and the characters. I really love to take bits and pieces from their background and their story or what a player is thinking of the concept that they're thinking about playing with or toying with. It could be a a theme that they want to explore, or it could be a particular background or particular perspective even that they wish to explore through this character. And I take that and I build it and bake it into the world. So I really love to have those types of connections and things to where the player like they're getting a full picture you're you're painting a picture for somebody mm-hmm. and you're how much paint are you putting on there how much are you giving the paintbrush to your players so you're not the only one world building but also like how are you invoking their senses to mm-hmm. fully be immersed within whatever you are creating. And to me, that's like the best thing uh, to do on top of what you both have said. So I literally have a note here that says (laughs) coloring book. (laughs) You you, you have bold outlines and you color in some, but you leave a lot of blank space. I love that we're both thinking of the same sort of, you know, how much do you paint and and color in and how much do you leave space? And I, I feel like there's a balance for that. Uh, that's sort of in the sort of what do you nail down and what do you leave open and definitely that sort of providing big structure is part of it and then the, that zoom in to the minutia is huge um like like pam said you're finding those little details and pulling them out and that, that feedback loop with your players is a massive massive thing because like my game design is weird right because so much of my game design is providing the container for you to make the world. And Mm -hmm. so really finding that place of like, okay, here's the container and here's the tool, here's the tools that I'm laying out of like world building tools and then go make it. So in the games that I write often, not always, but often there is that very intentional feedback loop of working back in what the players bring to the table so that you can do that exact thing of, Oh, you're interested. Your your characters bringing out this bringing. Oh, and I have these. I don't know. I have these really fancy earrings. They were my grandmother's. And I'm like, oh, really? 
what's that about? You know, and, and describe pull. them to me. Maybe yes. I do a memory where it's a flashback of a memory of her gifting them to you. So I describe that scene and it makes that memory connect with that mm -hmm. player. Um, you know, oh, you have a special item or there's a particular prayer or something connected with a sacred item even. Um, you know, things like that can be very powerful. It's a thing of like pulling in more of the senses. Um, and uh, Thousand One Nights, which I wrote a, a long time ago and really should revisit, you make your character by the describing them in sensual ways, you know, what's something that is, you know, that about them that is hearing, taste, touch, sight, and smell. And there's a reward mechanic to reward the, the GM for including more sensory world building, because I really, really want that. And I really wasn't seeing it at the time. And now I've got to figure out how to reinterpret that back into some of the other, other stuff. Pam, what do you think? You've, we've been talking, you know, a couple of things we've kind of skipped around, like how to make it real, what to nail down. Whatever. Well, the, the, the personal design, which I also need to revisit because it was one of the first big things I did, but stuff, right? Um, yeah. Sundo <laughs> Sun was meant to be a modular powered by the apocalypse game where the table mm. builds everything from the city to how your cycle pumps are to what the big bad is to who you are as a psychopomp and what you were when you were human. So the game wow. awards you for creating items and memories and emotion that your character currently doesn't understand. Uh, so you get points and empower yourself against a system that does not want you to remember. And at the end of the game, you can decide either as an individual player or a table to reclaim those memories and your power and fight the god or you can decide to stay as you are. There is no correct or wrong answer to it. Mm. So like, I think that's, that's, um, that's, that was the design space I was in, like dealing with memory, understanding loss and grief and understanding that things can change and that uh, there, there's no correct or wrong way to fight when it comes to a deep loss of yourself. Um, and I wanted a game that could really emphasize that that like your journey is a individual journey. It's not a, right. the world is expecting you to do a certain thing. So my toolbox was me just going, like, giving little checklists. Like what's the city like? Is it, uh, is it a scintillating wonder of technology? Is it a patchwork where the, right. the tensions between the forces are, are all like mixed and matched? Is it a tiny little hamlet or is it somewhere entirely different? Like each, everything was a checklist. So it was an exhaustive process, but everybody who played the game was like, whoa, I've never been able to really think about these things before. So they had a lot of fun just in the sandbox for like three sessions before we even got to play. <laughs> <laughs> so we need like a three hour. We really do. That we, we, really yeah, do. we really do. Because like it's already... And we're already at 28, nine minutes in. And I'm like, oh my gosh, oh. we have so many awesome questions here. And like, I want to do the little world building jam. Um, you I know we can totally take over a table chat over in the Discord for- 100%. We will take so over a table that. and continue this conversation. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll, try to, I'll try to jump in after my next panel. Cause after this, I got to hop to another one, but yeah. All right, great. so let's like, so- like super speed to see if we can answer these questions. I'm going to just like go through them and then we'll do like two word answers. Uh, what comes first, the map or the history of the world? History of the world. Sometimes the map, I freaking love maps. Who, uh, <laughs> uh, is there a particular world building tidbit that you tend to insert into any, almost all warlike create? What are they wearing? You follow the thread. Uh, you, it, everything that is human connects to thread. And I, find me in the <laughs> chat we'll talk i swear to god uh weaving like weaving is code why we are able to do this right now is because of, of because of uh textile history yes um yes. <clears throat> is there a world i'm currently building that i'm excited about yes oh we lost michelle she'll be back um mm -hmm. is there a world i'm currently building i'm excited about i yeah oh it's really tricky i've been working on it for years and years and years 
It's, uh, it's, it's women scientists in the 1880s, whatever, I'll deal with Ooh, it. Okay. Um, and uh, building the larger settings, just never do the monoculture thing. Like for me, yeah. one of the biggest tools is when I'm doing world, by, world building, I think about no further than a hundred miles from where I am. And I'm like, okay, what is the diversity of uh, geography, of uh, uh, ecology of psychology within a hundred miles. And if I, that's not a monolith. And so I need to use that as the model for my world and realize that it's less complex. That's my bit. Do you want to do the same real super quick? Like, and then we'll do the world building jam. Yeah, sure. Uh, so what comes first, the map or the history? History. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't do maps, unfortunately, but I love maps. I just can't do them. Um, is there a particular world building tidbit that you tend to insert? Queerness. I cannot go without it. Like, I have to make sure that my game represents my visions of queerness as best as possible. Whatever that mm -hmm. means depends on the game, but it'll always show an aspect of it for myself, unapologetically for me, right? Yeah. Is there a world you're currently building that you're excited about? <sighs> Dagger Isles for sure. Um, then I also have Blade, uh, yeah, Dagger Isles. Um, I want to revisit Sundo. I also want to go to my 7,107 Iscariots. It is a Devil May Cry inspired game, Tropical Goth, where the mechanic is everything is inventory down to your eyes and your fingers, and you will sacrifice those tidbits for power. So that's the we world I want to do. I can a little bit about that earlier. <laughs> Yes. Um, and right. then the last, um, when building larger multicultural worlds, do you keep various locales from becoming monocultural? Focus small bits. Always deal with the small bits. That's the best way of doing it. And sometimes that takes a lot of practice, but as long as you're zoning in real small and very focused, you will create differences versus everything being same, same. So that's yeah, me. Yeah. All right. Speed run, Michelle, and then we'll have the fastest world building game jam ever speed run based <laughs> on the questions in chat oh. yeah just just these four questions that we're just doing like what's your super quick and then we'll come up with a world oh we may have lost her again i love my oh, wi-fi no. oh. <laughs> all right uh, oh no yeah um can a world be built can you hear me Yep. yep. Okay. You got to talk fast. Um, <laughs> all right, let's go. Uh, can the world be built in this session be set somewhere else than Western European? Absolutely. I yes. feel like let's please you do that. 100% build it wherever you please. Um, to conform yourself into a particular space uh, can limit your creativity and the possibilities in which you can explore. Um, what comes first, the map or the history? Um, honestly, neither for me. I focus on the connections first and then build out from there. The map and the history essentially just kind of coalesce like that pudding Pam was talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it essentially becomes baked in. Um, is there a particular world building tidbit you tend to insert? Already answered that one. Uh, okay. Is there a world you're currently building that you're excited about? Yes, I currently have a personal project um, that I am working on where it's a post-apocalyptic um, coming from an indigenous background as well, um, utilizing my culture where there is this AI system that they have used to essentially create um, these drops. And you're in this um, matrix AI generated space and the um but it creates the space based on your memories or your personality so you have to go through and you have to make that yourself and then you try to get to the end of the drop with the fastest time so it has a little bit of like inception built into it a little bit um but it works a lot with what are you coming into that space with is what it will go ahead and challenge you with i'm nice. still working on a lot of that um when building large multicultural worlds or settings, how do you keep the various locales from becoming monocultural, um, but still unique and iconic? 
I am very much going to echo Pam's answer here, where as long as you are focusing down to a very particular point or you are putting the focus where the focus needs to be, I feel that you do create a lot of flexibility and a lot of variation in that. And also as you do that, um, while leaving space for other people to come in, you know, your table or um, eat the rest of your team and whatnot, it can evolve very naturally to have a lot of variation built into mm -hmm. it. So agree. All right. Are you ready? Yes. yes. We're going to build, we're going to build a world <laughs> in 10 minutes. <laughs> Hell yeah. Let's go. Okay. Let's do okay. it. Okay. Okay. Um, cool. Who's, who's got a, a first spark of like idea. I'm sorry. We started with food and pudding and I'm immediately thinking of slime <laughs> jello or like another dessert. So yeah, okay. we're not jello. Sure. Okay. Jello. Is this, a, is this like, is this an everyday food? <laughs> like, do they, do they, are they mostly the, are, are the people in the starting in this little detail? And building out the culture from there, which will let us build out the world further. Mm -hmm. Jello, is it actually actually Jello, or is it just a what pudding? Do you like consider Jello. Okay. What do you consider Jello? Do you think of it more of well, an environmental thing, more of a well? I was I like edible thing. <laughs> I'm like, is it actually an animal <laughs> product, or is it is it just like a gelatinous thing? seaweed can it be seaweed can we have like a seaweed carrot like i was literally carrot? just thinking algae <laughs> bacterial like yes jello. okay are we in space underwater underwater we are underwater okay. yes there is a top okay. side but that top side does not like us okay good and there are many different perceptions whether you're bottom or top I know that didn't come up right. So let's, let's pretend I'm professional. <laughs> Underwater. Okay. Conflict with the top side. Conflict or just like? I think a lot of misunderstandings. I like that better than conflict. Right? Like you, because people, tension comes from not quite knowing mm -hmm. and like from, from that discomfort of not quite fully getting it right or getting something and having your own preconceptions is this tension yeah. usually comes from there love that so were were we always down here or were we always in the water or did we come down here i think it would be cool if we had no idea love that right like so we, we, we may we we'll find that in we'll find that out in play yes yes I like okay that. Kind of like one day we weren't there, one day we were, and now that's that. This is who we are. Okay. We are here. Does it matter where we came from? Okay. And then I think the reason why it has to be jello is probably because of physiology, you know? So maybe like bottom, it's just nothing because it's easy to get. But imagine if it's topside, it's some kind of valuable, mysterious thing that can provide ultimate sub sustenance for you. You just have no idea how to make it just constantly dig it up from wherever's down there or whoever's down there. I love that. Do we? Okay. So for this, are we human or humanoid? Speaking from Jello's point of view, because <laughs> like I'm very, okay. Go for it. Yes. Okay. 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 There's this really amazing book. It's called Brain Plague. For those of in the audience who it is, it is a fant sci-fi fantasy. Uh, it does have uh, queerness in it. Yes, if I'm remembering correctly, it does have that in it. But it's written by a microbiologist, so it's talking about this molecular level society. And to me, Dig that it. the Jello kind of speaks that. So there can be a top side but also like are we from the perspective of the jello like is that a molecular level system well, you, or society i don't know i think, I think it would you just started out you started out by saying food and so the, yes. the jello was a food the pudding was a food so we're something that eat i think we're something that eats that we're something that eats the jello if I we're humanoid yeah 
then we have a wonderful question about physiology of how deep we mm -hmm. are and that one that raises all kinds of interesting world building questions about like concepts of beauty and concepts of shape and what is necessary and weightlessness and like i love all that i love okay. that there's also what? someone in, in chat who said either whaleish or octopi i'm okay with like either i mean yeah. not like tentacles uh -huh. and what would it be like what would it be like if instead of descending from apes as hominids do what if we were the aquatic ape we went into the water we never came out or what if we came what if it was an uplift situation and we we descended from some cetaceans mm. you know another way we can also look at it is the honeypot ants that use kind of like more of a fungus thing what if the mm -hmm. jello to a certain extent um is a similar symbiosis mm -hmm. or symbiotic relationship Mm-hmm. That's cool. And now I'm thinking about like what our dwelling spaces would look like because we're, mm -hmm. if we're if we're an aquatic species and we're having a symbiotic relationship with this um, algae type food that, you know, we may or may not be strictly vegetarian. A lot of a lot of a lot of aquatic species are, are um, opportunistic eaters. Mm -hmm. um, but we may have a dwelling space and I'm really like, like, like little rocky spaces with moss and I love rocks so much. So the idea of these little <laughs> rocky places and like, I know that like octopi can make themselves like little hats out of anemone, an yeah. uh, out of, um, uh, they make themselves hats out of shells and like yeah. carry them around. Yeah. And I just freaking love that. So that's, that is all. And also depending on the tide and everything, I'm guessing that that jello would also change, which means now you get the variations. Now you get the regionals um, yep. differences yeah. Yeah. in that. Yep. And that could very well play into um, the fashion as mm -hmm. well as like taste preferences or even bioluminescence. Gosh, I am always a sucker for bioluminescence. Oh, heck yes. If heck we yes. throw that in there, you know that there's going to be different regional colors or yep. like. Yep. Oh, yes. Yep. Yep. And yep. one of the things that this does in terms of world building is we've now created in a, like just a couple minutes, a ton. Like we could, <laughs> we could work on this and like, just what if, and how about, and follow the pieces of it for a long time until we had something that was really robust. And even if we, we do all this groundwork and then it's like, all right, so the stuff that we were, that we had at the beginning about a, the tensions and misunderstandings between the top side and the, the underwater and like this idea of the different, the, the algae being more valuable, up, uh, you know, upstairs above lays groundwork for so much fascinating world building game design etc cetera, etc cetera. because it may be if the three of us continued this we'd get to a point where we're like okay that's awesome but who are we playing in this scenario you know where's our story who are we you know what are we doing and then we'd find out right we'd figure out yeah. are we here and we like there's some conflict with the top side needing to harvest this this algae sus substance to live and that creates problems for us or we are our characters or point of view character in this game or story or whatever um from the top side and they're, they're having a first encounter kind of experience with this yeah. completely you know, this other complex culture we haven't even talked about what the, what's going up on top side, <laughs> which i love um yeah. And I, I mean, my hope in doing this sort of bit is that it would give a little bit of a sense to everybody watching, because I know we're like edging into the end of the time. Um, boy, this time goes so fast. <laughs> <laughs> that like really does when we're talking about Jello. <laughs> <laughs> but how, um, so in that sort of world building space where it, it, like how familiar did that feel to both of you? Or, or how different was that from how your usual world building processes? 
not much different for me, honestly, <laughs> honestly, because like I, uh, to, to be, to be completely real, right. Most of my design work these days is for other people. So I'm given something that came from other people instead of having to formulate an entirely different thing of my own. Right. So when I'm formulating an entirely different thing of my own, I've got my core design rules in my head, the intended like feeling of players, and I can move any pieces as I like. So mm-hmm. like this whole thing, this whole job is basically like, damn, game designer. Right. But like for when I'm doing it for another person, I tend to look at the gaps in their system. Like what made me happy or unhappy? Where where would I be in their world? And how do I make sure that I'm there? Like my biggest example that I have was when I did the uh, Spire Shadow Operations adventure because I was a series of small adventures. And my only thought was like, where's the queer women in this uh, in this book? They keep right. talking about like queerness and stuff. And that's really cool. And I know that they're, they're very supportive of that stuff, but where is it? So my entire narrative was just like, okay, the main twist is that person, that scary, fiery, flowery, bleeding saint that remembers nothing the main antagonist is connected to another antagonist that loves that person. Mm -hmm. They're both women. So I was like, I'm going to take this. I'm going to make it gay. Right. And then for, for Dagger Isles, you know, I love Blades in the Dark, but I was also wondering, but where, where would I be? Where would a South Asian be in this setting? And then I Mm -hmm. wanted to expand that and like involve the language on that to create a space. Right. So that's, that's, Mm -hmm. that would be my feeling on it. Mm-hmm. What about you, you, Michelle? You find a spot in the scaffolding or a spot in the foundation, and you're like, this needs a few more bricks, and this dovetails like perfectly in with this, 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 and this, and this. And that's what you do. The only thing I probably would say uh, is I don't necessarily ask the questions. I usually just do a brainstorming and I just get a bunch of things essentially around and then I start putting them together like building blocks and seeing what makes a good scaffold for things to build and essentially become coherent from here. And that's usually how I, how I end up doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And I do it a lot. Like I do a lot like we did. And I also think about editing a lot. If I was actually going to put this into a a game, there'd be a lot of the, sort of looking at all the parts and then editing back of like, all right, where, where do I need to leave more breathing space for Mm -hmm. the other, other players? And like, just having the questions that have come up in the chat of folks saying, what species are you? What animal would be best equipped to eat jello? And I'm like, oh my God, we have like some sort of long proboscis thing. Like that's fascinating. Um, or fa- fashion statements. You're going to breed up like, straws and jello like every 90s kid that was ever taught by their parents to be like, stop blowing Do bubbles you in know, your okay. jello. The, the day my daughter was born, you know, that was a thing in the the hospital room because they gave us these freaking little tubs of jello. And I'm like, stop with the jello. Anyway, whatever. Um, the the piece that is most like this for me and like one of the pieces of like how you do game design or not how you do game, how does how you do world building on the fly, right? Because that's mm-hmm. a big part of like how do I help people do both parts, both the thing that we've done here and that we've all talked about of like building games and doing game design and building worlds that, that go in those games and you know really like thought full thought out mapped out process and the other piece is how do you spin up this stuff on the fly like fast how do we be sitting here the three of us you know playing a game and i someone says my grandmother's earrings and that it bounces back and we reincorporate and really for me it's about remembering what it was like to do this when i was a little little kid like i have a i have like Pam's nodding, like you've heard me say this before, like this sort of spontaneous, what if this, that is our birthright as mammals, like our, as little, we just like, oh, and then we do this, but just remember, just remember what it's like to be little and mm-hmm. be that excited about sharing what's going on in your world. And then that's where it like comes instantly to me. People will ask me a question about like, how does this rule in apocalypse world work? And I 
often cannot answer unless I do world building. I'm like, okay, so you're playing this and I'm playing this and this just happened and then this, and that gives them the answer. Yeah. Yeah, you do a little world building just just in your brain as you're sitting there. like, And then you're like, okay, well, what type of post-apocalyptic are we talking? Are we talking like this, that? And like, as soon as you find that certain slot, you're like, okay, this genre. And then you just start building it from there. Yeah. 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 (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So we have a couple minutes left. Do we, are there other questions? We want to see if there's another question in the chat and I'm ready to go talk about this for like an hour in the afterward and everybody else is welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know if there were more questions from the chat. If they are, put them here. Thank you. Very helpful behind the scenes people. Um, and then else beyond that, do we want to do our little, like, where can you find which of us and what we're working on and what to look for next sort of thing? Michelle, go ahead. (laughs) Putting you on the spot. Yes. Fine. Okay. Um, You can find me on social media at uh, Mistletoe T-Rex and on Instagram or Twitter. Uh, I rarely ever post. The most place you will actually find me is in my Discord or any Discord, really. Um, And uh, deets and everything, I'm pretty sure, are popping up somewhere uh, Mm. for this. And, um, yeah, you can also find me personally um, for commissions and things like that at my website at voidalspace.com. Um, or you can just email me at nichellevoidalspace.com. Um, yeah. More than happy to uh, look into whatever project or world building you have. So, yeah, that's it. Awesome. Short and sweet. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, I'm the only McGay Baker in the world. M-E-G-U-E-Y Baker. If you Google that, it's me. Um, I have a weird, in, I have a weird intentional misspelling of a kind of obscure Mexican floral name. It's a little bit like naming your daughter Hydrangea. But if you Google that, you'll find me. I'm on Twitter at Night Sky Games. I'm on Mastodon at um, McGay B. I'm all over Discord. I run the Apocalypse World Discord server. Um, the things that I have coming up, we're working on Burned Over. Um, which is an apoc- like apocalypse world thing that actually has a little bit more world building in it uh, or world setting stuff going on. Um, I'm going to do a second edition of Cyrun. That'll be fun. Lots of maps. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of the big thing. The, the sort of piece that I want to do world building on is uh, Young Ladies of Quality, which is a deep cut for those of you who have known me for a long time. Talking about Young Ladies of Quality goes back, but I just had a, a insight that I could do that as a Firebrand framework game, so that would be exciting. Pam, where can we find you, and what are you working on? Oh, so I'm currently the dovetailer, and probably forever will be on um, on Card. So it's C A R R D dot uh, C O. Uh, that's my main website. I do have an itch, also the dovetailer. I primarily use Twitter. I'm also all over Discord. I also have a Mastodon. I have a Tumblr, but it's barely used. I have an Instagram, if you want that too. Um, <laughs> then, I guess, right? Um, I have LinkedIn. That's a GDC carryover, because apparently LinkedIn is a professional thing. So if you want to add, add me on Pampons 11 LinkedIn, cool. Go ahead. I swear to you, I'll try to use it. Um, what I'm currently working on, Dagger Isles, as you all know, the Navithem will be uh, working into fulfillment soon now that we are fully backed. And uh, for those Yay! of you with Kickstarter, I think Backer Kit will let you order uh, once we have that going. So, more updates in the future. Yes, I want to work on 7,107 Iscariots, where again, you blow off pieces of yourself or things you own or memories or whatnot to you know, do virtuous or, or like vicious actions. So that's one thing I want to do. Then my eternal love baby, which has never gotten done waking the dead. I swear to you, one day I will do it. <laughs> I keep telling we should people. do, <laughs> someday we should do a panel. Somebody should do a panel on like white whale games where they're like, <laughs> the game that like we, I just want to do it. I don't know how. Oh my God. There's a game I want to do so much called Intertwined. And it's a game that does the sort of uh, ironic switch that a No Henry story does. And I can, I have not cracked how to yeah. do that, but I will. 
I promise. No, I will. I, yeah, I, I want that panel too. I have way too many <laughs> and they're all screaming quietly at me as I do other yeah. things. And I'm just like, one yeah. day, my children, one day. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I came from the video games panel. That's the last thing. I am working on uh, just another FF14 hack. So it's literally called Jeff dash FF14. Uh, that is a purely passion pro project because obviously Square has not hired me and I just want to do a thing. <laughs> so that's also what I'm working on. I have some slides here and there uh, for posting. But yeah, that's um, that's me for now. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. And it's also like just listening to like what we're working on. There's a lot of world building. There's a lot of like the world. There's too much world for one world. You know, but I have one other big thing. If you don't know about Jerry's map, this is a piece of Jerry's map. And if our our friendly link person could put, you know, find Jerry's map. This is a guy who is so inspiring to me as a game designer and a world builder. Uh, he has been working on a map for of his own, his own world, his own design for like 50 years. It is astonishing. He has a whole game that he's made to iterate on it. It is there's so much there for us to learn about world building. I just would go on and on and on about it. Um, yeah, I I want to just keep talking to all of you. What should we talk about next? <laughs> we were so prompt, like we we got like we were like ready to talk for hours, and then I was like, oh, let's get it going. We just got bam, really bam. prompt, and now. Um, now we're really like, like, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. There's a question right. in the chat for you, my dear. Yeah. Jerry's map. I'm looking, I think it's Jerry's map.com, but I will find it. It is. It's Jerry's map. Uh, J E R R Y S M A P.com. And, uh, in the it, he, 1963, he was a kid. He started drawing a map. He's been map drawing it ever since. Um, it's unbelievably cool. Um, yeah. So um, I think we did good. <laughs> Are we going to continue making yeah. Jello? <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So we yeah. where where did we leave our merry adventurers? We were talking about um, where they might live and their habitats, and yes. that you know whether they you know, would be made little houses out of rocks. Um, do we think, what do you think about clothes? Are, do they wear clothes? Uh, if it's if it's a cetacean, if it's a human development from a cetacean, do we have blowholes and not noses? Well, I'm going to have to leave you two to answer that because I have a panel in a few minutes, but I love all of you. Love you. Uh, this was thank great. You. Thank you. Everyone, thank you for watching. You'll see me literally in 12 minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye, Pam. Hey, you're